or something like that. Up to your life. Should be here. I call to order the uh, September 2022 uh, work session to set the agenda for next week's uh, board meeting, uh, Committee of the Whole. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Bibla. Here. Mr. Brogna. Here. Mrs. Campbell. Mrs. Haddix. Mrs. McCurdy. Here. Mr. Macri? Here. Mr. Nerdome? Here. Mr. Swank? Here. And Mr. Boom? Here. Seven members present. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us in, in person and also through our YouTube channel. And um, I would like to announce the Act 93 administrators that are present here today. And um, our motto this year is team behind the team. So I'm going to announce who's here. So part of the team, we have Miss Joanne Black. She's our interim business manager. We have Mr. John Gorham. He's our principal at the secondary campus. We have Mr. David Simonovich, director of transportation. We have Mr. Scott Brummigen, director of buildings and grounds. We have Mr. Jeff Parentoni, vice principal of the secondary campus. We have Ms. Peg Foster, Director of Curriculum, K-12, Rice Elementary Principal. We also have Mr. Kevin Sayer, a Fairview Elementary Principal. We have Ms. Beth Ann Harris, Director of Special Education. And I also would just like to announce that we have Jonathan here, our IT, always Hello, the person behind the scenes that makes it happen every day. And we have Ms. Otero um, here as well, so thank you. Okay, thank you. And Stephanie Whitechalk, Natasha. Oh, very good. She was able to attend virtually. So Ms. Whitechalk is attending virtually. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, and we will uh, start. Uh, transportation. Mr. Nardone. Oh, that's me, right? Okay, roll call. I'm here. Ms. Dilla? Here. Mr. Macker? Here. We're looking to uh, approve the minutes of the August 11th Transportation Committee, and I'll be seeking approval for the recommendation consideration of Reinheimer and Shivarella. I'll make a motion for the minutes. A second. All in favor? Aye. Any questions on the Reinheimer and Shivarella from the board? Any from the public? I move we accept them. Second. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Open discussion. Any comments from the board? Questions? Have we had any update on um, our camera systems? I know they weren't turned on yet, but they're all ready. They're ready. They're installed. They're ready to go. It's just the policy thing. And once it's ready, it'll be hooking a computer up to each DVR and you know deactivating sound and reactivating it. So it's ready to go. That's a good work. So where are we on the um, cameras on the bus on? I reached out on Tuesday and have not heard back yet. So I did reach out for our admin meeting and I did not get an answer yet. So I will reach out again. Are the cameras installed on the stop arms? Yeah. No. No. Not being installed yet. For very long. They claim they bring a large crew in and they could do three to four buses a day. So I mean, you're probably looking at roughly a two-week timeline, mm -hmm. at least by what they gave me. So I mean, we'll see when they get started. They, they targeted October. Like, will, will they take a bus out of service to do that for we that? Do have, they have like three sub buses. Okay. Three or four sub buses. They just got their two new ones in. So I think they have four sub buses now, so it won't be a big issue to rotate. It would just be, you know, because you can stick on numbers right. and just go and won't miss a beat. Sounds good. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, with that, we're adjourned. Um, human resources, Mrs. Bibla.
Mr. Brogna? Here. Roll call, Mr. Swain. Here. I make a motion to approve the minutes of August 11th, 2022. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. I'll be looking for approval of items one through five to move to the board agenda. Any questions from the board? Uh, no questions. I don't know a, a couple of these people personally, but I have worked here uh, in the past and uh, I could congratulate and thank uh, Mrs. Black for her service to the, the district. She has been a rock. Thank you. Any questions from the public? Items one through five. Seeing none, I make a motion to move items one through five to the board agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have any open discussions for human resources? How are we on our building substitutes? Are they all started or all here? Two and two here, one at Elk Rice, one at Fairview. And how are we implementing their time? Are they dedicated to those buildings? They're, de they're, dis they're dedicated to the buildings, but on an as-needed basis, for example, if there's no need for a sub in the secondary campus, and there is at Rice or Fairview, they will go over that. Well, so I have a follow-up question to that. Is it outside of the building subs? What is our, how, how large is our substitute list overall in comparison to last year? The num number of overall approved subs? A lot better as each day goes on. So but did we start up the school year with more than we had at the start of last about year? About the same but every day more and more subs coming in. And a lot more emergency certs coming through than we had before. How are we handling using the subs to cover during the teacher they're covering course planning period? I, I, each building does it differently. You might wanna ask the principal like um, better, but I know here they all seem to cover they, the one secretary that I work with over here, she she rotates them as is. The day-to-day -day subs, like today, reported in as I was there. Like, I see so-and-so is going to be off for the next three days. Do you want me here? Like, they have good communication going on in the, the office with her. What, what I'm asking is, the sub gets assigned to cover for a teacher that's off. Mm -hmm. When that teacher has a planning period, what are we doing with the substitute during that teacher's that schedule? We utilize them for where we need them. And who's responsible for that assignment? How do we how do we gauge that, or how do we know that we're Our utilizing? Our secretary knows what the schedule is, so we'll know what what teacher they're in for. We know the schedule. Yeah. Our subs obviously do like the planning periods. They'll reassign them somewhere else. Right. So like even if they're in the cafeteria, or it's usually if there's no work on the other in the study hall. Cafeteria for all these. Yeah, no, <clears throat> so when it gets more busy, um, when there's a lot of people off and a lot of coverage, they'll get a, their daily schedule for the day. So it's not like they just are following the teacher schedule. That, you know, if, they might know it from the past. It'll say you're going here, 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 and we're filling them in where needed so that we don't have to use another teacher to cover somewhere else. Right. So they're full all the way through. The only thing that, that we're required to give them is a lunch. Trying to minimize those comp periods. Oh, absolutely. That's, absolutely. Any other questions? Seeing none, move to adjourn human resources. Thank you. All of you, Mr. Macri. Roll call, Mrs. McCurdy. Here. Ms. Campbell. Here. Seeking a, a motion to approve the minutes of August 11th. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Carries. I'll be seeking uh, a motion on approval to recommend item one 
uh, two policy, one for a first reading and one for a first reading and adopt. The only thing is we have to take the audio off of there. It has changed on the policy. It just was not yet. Say that one do, more do, time. Does so that reflect so, a policy yeah, so, name or? The, so the policy name will reflect the policy. So you're taking the audio off of everything, then you should to, be taking it off of the title as well. Okay. So it's just me transportation video recording. Correct. I need to motion that, Jeff. On this, just to change the name. Can we just carry it Th to that's, next week? That, that is the minimus. So we're just going to move it to next right. week. And when the agenda yeah, comes, comes out, out next week, yeah. we'll just have a video next week. So it would be a motion to move them as amended. Motion to move the, to the September 15th meeting as amended. Any questions on the item? I had a question on, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> on the, the signage and decoration. Um, first, oh, actually, the one looks like it was taken off because the first one that was sent to me had Schuylkill Valley on it and I couldn't understand the connection but it looks like it's not on the one that's right definitely. so that so was that like was an example okay. Oh. that you got yeah okay all right so that was yeah off. the one that you got this afternoon that should be all ready right that should, yeah that's yeah. what I just noticed on that I just pulled that one up mm -hmm. now and I noticed and I didn't know if guidelines under the part where it says uh comply with I felt like I felt like it was a little vague under guidelines at one part where it sounded like it was just up to the administrator's discretion and just wondering if we needed another part that said according to board policy like just the way maybe it's just the way I'm reading it um, so the one kind of made it sound like if it had to do with curriculum it had to do with board policy but anything that didn't have to do with curriculum um, are subject to removal at the administration's discretion and I thought just for clarity, I didn't, we to can, me it felt like it could still be, you know, based on our policies. We can continue okay. to, to review okay. it. Um, this is just the, definitely <coughs> the first yeah. reason, yeah. reading. We have right now, it must comply with board policy right. and procedures. But I see what you're saying too, and we can, we can okay. evaluate that. Okay, sure. Oh, video story. <clears throat> he had to leave. Um, mm. I believe it's three days. Three days? Yeah. So when you take out, you're talking, to, I'm sorry, which one? On the buses. That's my bus. So okay. how long are, the, are they stored? Who has access to them? And where are they stored? <clears throat> so they're on a disc, kind of like the old cameras where mm -hmm. you set the disc. So once there's a situation that we need to pull it, we have to put one back in. Mm -hmm. So they will go over. They'll rotate it. They will rotate it. Um, David has access to it, and then certain building principles, like you know, one from the secondary campus, Rice and Fairview, will be trained how to view it. But most of the time, it's going to be the director of transportation getting the information and then working with the administrator that needs to review it for um, the reason that was asked for the video. Any open discussion? We, we need to move. Uh, motion to move to uh, agenda as ag as uh, amended. amended. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any open discussion questions? On policy? Motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All in okay. favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Academic programs, Mrs. Campbell. Thank you. Uh, roll call, uh, Ms. McCurdy? 
Here. Mr. Nardone? Here. Uh, I'd like to approve the minutes of the August 11th um, Academic Program Committee meeting. Um, I so move. Second. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I'm also asking approval uh, to move the following items um, to the board meeting, items one and two. Um, if there's any questions on those items from the board, from the, from the public or staff, okay. then I, I make a motion to move the items one and two to the board meeting. I'll second. Motion. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, okay, and then for open discussion, I'd like to start. Um, Ms. Foster has, has some discussion on the comprehensive uh, plan at this point. This is just in case anybody just, <laughs> You're scaring no, me here. No, I'm I'm sure. Sure. This is just in case there's questions, I'm prepared. So if you don't mind taking one, yeah. passing them around while I fire up. Times one page. Oh, one page. <laughs> you get to turn around. Or you can slide over there if that's better. I can move it My family, hello. All right, Jonathan. Jonathan. Hang on just a moment. Look how nice that looks, everyone. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> So, uh, just a, a quick overview. Um, many of you were here for the development of the comprehensive plan, but many of you weren't. So, I just wanted to cycle back through how the comprehensive plan is formatted. This is not a new endeavor. In fact, comprehensive planning has been ongoing for decades uh, under a variety of names. It has been called strategic plan, long range planning. And uh, the names change over time, but the, the ultimate premise is the same, to think about where we are now, what our current status is, and where we want to go as an entity. So with that in mind, this current comprehensive plan is the second that I've developed here at Crestwood. Uh, the first was back in 2016. And throughout our time together, we've used a very similar process. We gather people that are interested in joining this committee from across a broad spectrum of our community. It includes members of our board, teachers, administrators, parents, community members, students, and uh, local business representatives. So those planning meetings are in the beginning, March 4th, March 20th, April 22nd, September 14th, are really an analysis of where we were. And then moving forward after we design, these are what our big projects and, and big focus needs to be, I continue to present and share with you different pieces of the puzzle. And I probably don't say, this is part of the comprehensive plan, because you would get tired of me saying this is part of the comprehensive plan. Because every board meeting, something is part of our discussion that is related to this, be it um, guidance hours, be it social work, be it um, admentum or rhythm or exact path, there's, there's always something. Technology is part of it. Finances are always part of it. There's always something that we discuss in these meetings that's related to the comprehensive plan. And maybe I should be throwing up the flag and saying, oh yeah, that's part of it more often. And in hindsight, I probably should. But the, the overall target is to remember that why, what we do, what we do. The mission of our school district is to support students personalized learning so that they're ready to go to college or a career after they leave us. That's, that's just what we want. 
We want our kids to leave us ready to go. So how do we get there is we keep in our mind that, whoops, sorry, that their future is our real goal. That's what it comes down to. College and career ready. Bless you, Scott. Your future is our goal. That's the big picture. So how do we get there? We take a look at what's important to us. So the committee in 2021 took a look at what kind of characteristics do we want our kids to be able to think about and how do we support that? So we feel felt as a committee that we wanted our individuals to be developed so that they could adapt to change. Now, we realized that this was in the throes of COVID when we were starting to plan this. So having the ability to adapt to change was, was first and foremost in our mind because we were in the midst of a broad change. We also saw that uh, diversity was increasing in our school district, thank you to people moving around our country to try and find places that they were more comfortable, so diversity became a, an important part. We knew that technology was important because we were living on technology, spending our time all day long. Kids, parents, teachers, technology was our life. So that was important, it still is. As the phone is in my pocket buzzing, it, it still is. Um, we believe that a quality education involves all of us, not just the kids and the teachers, just it involves our community. We believe that all kids can achieve, regardless of, of where your strengths and shortcomings are. Everyone has the capacity to achieve. And we also believe that the purpose of education is to build productive citizens. Remember, your future is our goal. It all sort of seems to fit. So as we continued forward, we thought our way through, what are the big buckets that we need to think about? So the big buckets included instructional improvement, leadership focused on improvement, student-centered focus. What do our kids need? They are our customers. If you think about it from a business perspective, our students are our customers. Data-driven, so that we use our human capital to the best of our possible use human capital. We talked about it again today. Where are those substitutes filling in? Using human capital. Uh, also, how do we organize ourselves so that we're strategic in what we do and why we do it? So those were the big focus of the conversations, and they continue to be that. So the organization of the comprehensive plan is, is multi-layered. The big umbrella piece is the overall district comprehensive plan. And that plan really takes a look at the big 10,000 foot view picture of what does Crestwood community feel like and where are we going. Then it's broken down into more operational chunks because what's appropriate for a kindergartner is definitely different than what's appropriate and goal wise for a senior. That kindergarten is just learning how to function in a societal group called a classroom. A senior is thinking about, all right, now my future is right here in my face. I'm freaking out because I'm not really sure where I'm going. I need to think hard about what I want to do and how am I going to get there. Different perspectives. So those different perspectives are tailored into the school level plans. We have three schools, therefore we have three school level plans. So when we think about goals, we also think about them in a smart goal for format. We want them to be systemic, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So they all have components of benchmark, stop gap, sort of stop and check points. What I'm doing for you now is one of those stop and check points because I want to make sure that we all are thinking and where are we? Are we on target? Do we need to make some adjustments along the way? Sort of like a roadmap. When we think about the data that we have available, there are probably a hundred other pieces of information that I could have put here that I didn't. The student data that I listed is it includes the Future Ready PA Index, and on the Future Ready PA Index will also be components to show you the progress for our secondary campus, Rice and Fairview Elementaries. This presentation will be posted on our website under the school board section, Comprehensive Education Planning and you'll be able to see this presentation. That top link is clickable. It'll take you to the Future Ready PA Index, and you'll be able to dig into what our data looks like, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, we also look at our students' growth data. Where were they? Now where are they performing? We found in 
the impact of COVID has shown that growth to be not as strong as we want it to be. And that's part of our plan moving forward is to try and address that, not try to address that. We also look at individual student scores. We look at, these are, are more focused on the, the mid-level, like grades three through eight. These are primary grade levels where we're taking a look at, especially DIBBLE stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. This talks about letters make sounds and sounds make words. So we've got assessments for as young as kindergarten through seniors in high school. So we're looking at all kids across where they're performing. So, with that in mind, our global camp, uh, comprehensive plan looked at three priority areas. And within those three priority areas, we wrote targets for specific measurable components that made sense in that priority area. The first one was student growth in ELA and math. So, our, this is the outcome category around some essential standards that the Department of Ed has, has driven for us. But the real purpose is to support individualized learning and use data so that the growth between where they were in 2021 and where they are in 2024 is at least 25% individually. So how do we measure that? We take a look at their um, three benchmark windows. Last year we were looking for a 15% growth, then a 20, and then a 25% growth. Why those numbers? Because they're double what the, Fed, the, the national expectations are. That was our measurement. What was last year's number? You're going to make me dig into my pile. I'll have to do that later. And I'm just curious. Yes. So when you say, mm -hmm. like, last year's 15%, this year's 20%, is it 20% from the initial or 20% from the previous year? From the beginning of the year to the end of the year. From the beginning of the year right. to the end of the year. Okay. So from here... The second one was curricular alignment. And this was to be certain that the curriculum that we're teaching in our classrooms is in alignment with the state and federal mandate measurements. So it's aligned to the PSSAs as well as aligned to the keystones. So that we're teaching the students the skills that are being measured on those assessments. More specifically, the keystone, but in the elementary grades, it, the uh, PSSAs. We've developed a six year curriculum revision cycle that was approved by the board. And that revision cycle takes a look at each content area across a six-year span. It includes a review phase, a writing and implementation, rewriting phase, um, an implementation phase of two years, then a step back revision, comparison, contrast of where we were to where we need to be, and repeat the cycle. This year's focus is math. I will be pulling the math teachers at least once, if not twice a quarter to just check on where are we now and what do we need to address. Why math? Um, I would sort of like to tell you that this was a brilliant stroke of genius of mine, but it wasn't. It was driven truly by the fact that math scores took a huge, huge hit in COVID. So we put it up front on purpose so that math was our focus early in the six-year revision cycle. Um, so that last screen, so that's a very high-level important goal for the district. They're all high-level important okay. goals for the district. So we don't know off the top of our head how we did compared to that goal? Where's my box? So. You know, rather than taking everyone's time, mm -hmm. how about you and I talk about this later? That's fine. Mm -hmm. So. As we continue to move forward, the next sub-level goal was around the fact that we were concerned with our students being isolated in their homes around the COVID pandemic issues of social isolation. So we talked at length about the fact that we needed to be able to support our students across multiple spectrums of not just academic performance, but also how do we support the emotional needs of our students? So the uh, planning committee suggested that we develop a multi-tier system of support, which is what MTSS stands for, that supports age-appropriate and developmental needs of kids across the district. May I borrow this? So is this you building this into the curriculum, or is it already in the curriculum? It is actually on this form, 
that Beth Ann was so eloquently put together. This form lays out the difference between the, the supports that are already embedded within our school's academic systems and the supports that are already embedded within Is our... Is it in the curriculum right now? Yes, parts of it are. Okay. Parts of it are. And it's getting more built into the curriculum. If we decide to continue forward, yes. So let me just share with you. Why do we need to take a valuable class time? Why isn't this just part of everyday normal? It is. Life? If you I mean, let me finish my time sentence. away from math and reading. If you let me finish my sentence. I can get to it. These are the systems. If you refer to this side of the page, that are already built into what we already do in schools. So the academic supports are three levels of support: tier one, the green level at the bottom. These are universal supports that happen for every kid. In other words, this is what happens in classes every single day. In these classes, we teach reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, uh, that's math. We teach civics. We teach um, public speaking. This is what happens for every student. This is the traditional curriculum. This is what happens every day. Part of the traditional curriculum is also how to behave appropriately in school. Those are our school rules. Those are the classroom expectations. These are the systems that are built into our school day, like uh, the bell rings, you transition to a new class, you sit down, you go to your next class. Um, in the elementary school, the traditional systems are you've got English class, the teacher tells you to put away your English book, now it's time to get out math, and we shift to math class. These are the universal supports that work for every student. Everyone receives the green level of support. Some students are not successful with the green level of support and need additional help. They fall into the yellow band. This is called Tier 2 intervention. The Tier 2 intervention students are kids that need additional support so that they can get the skills to be successful with what happens for everybody in, green, in the green level. So in the academic world, these are students that need uh, Title I interventions in some areas for extra reading. Maybe they need help with uh, identifying letters and letter sounds. They may need help in math, doing basic multiplication, basic addition, or subtraction facts. Those are tier two interventions that happen within the school day. They may be happening in the classroom or they may be happening in small pullout groups. These are some students, not all. Remember green is for all students. Yellow is for some students. After we spend some time giving interventions to kids, if those interventions are successful, we either do two things. We either continue the, the treatment, also known as support, or we start to bring that support back and gradually release the kid to independence and back into green levels of everybody gets the same thing. Make sense? It's sort of when your doctor says to you, you take two tablets every day, and then take one tablet every day, and then take one tablet every other day. Same kind of a titration off of the level of support to, to help the kid get back on track. There are students, can I get to red or you got a question about yellow? Okay. There are students that do not do, that do not find the success level that they need in the yellow level. They need more. Those are our tier three intervention students that need more support because what we're doing for them with a little bit of help isn't getting them the, the skills that they need. So when they need more support, we give them more support. It's typically smaller groups. It's longer pullout of their classroom duration. It may include an IEP, an individualized education plan. It may include a Section 504 accommodation for a student to have extended time. All of those things are also happening within our school day and help the students access learning at their level for what they need. So the pyramid is shaped in a pyramid on purpose. The big spot on green on the bottom is large because this applies and most of our students perform very well in the green level. About uh, five to 10 percent of our students need additional support in the yellow level and about three to five percent need supports at the red level. This is, so, Mrs. Harris, you created this tier, right? Yeah. I mean, is, are these accurate stats, or generally speaking, the statistics? For our district, usually it's um, typically the red tier is about 2% for special education, right. but when you add in mental health, that grows to about 5%. I mean, 
because five, even 5% five is pretty significant. And then, then my second question, because I realized that you had a team leader helping to yeah. develop this, have we seen an extraordinary increase? I guess this would be, maybe that's not, have, where's the increase been in terms of students that have graduated to needing that red level? And, and is it pandemic related? Is it, you know, we talk about a diverse population in our district. What are your thoughts on that growth in our district? I will say that I have seen um, this year, so I've only been with the district three years, and so a lot of my time here has been COVID, right? So this year, I think, has been um, the first real year for for me. I have seen a lot of um, students registering with the district that have a higher level of need than, uh, and I would say it would be completely significant statistically, okay. um, with new students registering with a higher level of uh, in saying that, I also have seen an increase in mental health support. So that's talking about like the special education hat. On the flip side, there are a lot of regular education students that need access to mental health supports. Mm -hmm. I would say that I am also seeing a significant increase in that population. However, I think that we have worked really hard to increase offerings mm -hmm. of support. So is that just because we have offerings to offer that we're, you know, that actually it's a good thing because people are accessing it. So I would say, you know, there's not a shortage. All of the new programs that we've developed, like the LIU and now has an outpatient um, office here on our, in our building on the secondary campus. If a student required counseling, their family transportation was an issue, they couldn't get to Wolfsbury or Manifold or some of those mm -hmm. um, services, they can get them right here on campus. All of our services that we have like that are full in our operating capacity. Um, and I would say that that's, that's a plus because we know that we're reaching students that may have had those issues previously True. and not been serviced. True. Um, so I, I'm really proud of the way that our team has worked to increase the supports for our students. I would say, you know, if you were to ask me, it's never enough. Um, but I think a lot of, I, I hear a lot of conversation around and I hear Mr. Nackery and I, I Mr. Acker, I would love to sit and talk to you about some of the things and show you the things that we've kind of worked on more specifically. But when you say that word curriculum, it's not so much that we're changing anything that has historically been taught. These are things, as Mrs. Foster mentioned, that we have always been teaching. It's creating a framework around them so everybody knows how to access them. Everybody knows the developmentally appropriate time to introduce them. Um, so it's really just measuring and quantifying and creating a framework around the things that we already do. Why do we want to dedicate curriculum time? It's so what it's we, we've been doing. We've been very successful. We, our problems, our staff, we've expanded offerings. Why does that need to be built into the curriculum? So Why aren't we focused may, on math? May I, um, excuse me, Beth Ann, and uh, may I just interject? It's, it's what about. you all went through as a student in the school district. You have received the same services, um, although not called services. You received the same support as everyone else. And it's not building into a curriculum, it's being a good person. When you see a child struggling, you say, okay, I think I need to send you um, to the guidance office. Or do I need to reach out and get you more support? Guys, that's been happening since you were in educational system. Nothing's changed. It's the same thing we're doing. We're just making, we have now more available support that were not available 20 years ago. So more is better, I agree. Okay. Why? Why build it into a curriculum target when we're already doing it? It's not, it, it's not built into a curriculum. It's is it built in our, into it in the our person, curriculum plan? Into Stephanie? a person. Is, is, is it it's in our in, curriculum plan? Built into your heart. Your so, yes, I totally agree with you. It's very important. Is it built into the curriculum? Not currently. It was a goal of a comprehensive plan. Not currently. So I have a framework if you would like to sit down at a, a So time. in the curriculum plan that's on the website now, it's not called out. Plan. Comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan. It is a goal in the comprehensive plan which spans 2021 to 2024. Right. So in 2021, it was decided mm -hmm. that this was a goal of the comprehensive plan. At that time, I was selected with a team of people to lead the charge on this particular component. 
I have developed a website that specifically lays this all out. It's not published anywhere yet. I haven't shared it. It has framework, um, you know, that specifically I think explains it further. But it's not. It's not like a book you're going to order and you have a teacher sit down. It's not. It's not a standalone curriculum. It's built into. Okay, we're talking about uh, how countries, different cultures, got along. Oh, how does this apply to us? How do we get along with other people? It's it's not a standalone. It's and as how you and as interact, of staff, how you teach. What it allows us to do is to have quantifiable and measurable um, areas to look and say, okay, if we're observing someone in a classroom, are they hitting these components developmentally that we want? Right now, they, they've historically always been things that we, good practices or best practices, but we're writing it down so we're, we can observe it and we can measure it. So you're taking time away from math, There's science, no and reading away from it. and building it into a curriculum on something we're already doing as part of our natural you know, life. We're creating the, a you know, the golden the rule, being nice to others, no bullying, so we're all the things that historically we do very well here. Okay, so that's just a framework so it allows us to measure the things we're already doing. It's not a new anything. There's so, but you're you're building it. it in, and you're taking time away from the others by no, saying we're going to. No, I would say this. that that's completely inaccurate. So it's not going to be in the curriculum. Um, John, if I may, you and I have um, been together in organizations prior. So I just want to take you back to say you're in a high school history class and you're talking about Rwanda, how the two cultures clashed. How did this happen? How could they learn? to get along. How could that's what you're embedding, quote unquote, uh, into the curriculum. It's called a discussion. It's not a curriculum. But if you embed it in the curriculum, now it becomes a goal for the teachers and for the coursework. That doesn't seem to be the, the main goal of what we're here for. I mean, it's certainly part of what we do every um, day. We do it every day in our own, life. And we're, we're nice to others. If we we're only here for no academics, bullying. if we're only here for academics, we are doing a disservice to our community. Because, John, as you know, um, just from taking it from Little League Baseball, there are children that need more. It's if we only say, okay, I'm only going to talk to you about reading, math, writing, we are doing them a disservice. Correct? But we're not doing that now. Right now, when we see people that need services, we refer them. We have the, the services. We're expanding those services. My question is, why are we looking to put this into the curriculum? I'll give you a, a today um, example, Stephanie. Uh, I, I got a today example. I have a, a five-year-old who is right but has no idea how to function in a classroom never been in a preschool never been in a daycare living with mom correct and step correct. grandparents this yep. child needs a teacher that knows and understands how to support support mm -hmm. this child's social and emotional development and she's doing as much as she can she needs more support we've already elevated and that's not curriculum to the yellow level of interventions because he needs more help. Bright young boy. And it's and not a curriculum. It's called being a good person. Right. I think if I can interject mm -hmm. Stephanie and everyone mm -hmm. here, I think that the word curriculum, mm -hmm. it, maybe we need to adjust the word curriculum. And this will be part, I don't want to take mm -hmm. a couple of your slides okay. in the future, but this will be an ongoing mm -hmm. discussion moving forward with some mm -hmm. goals with the committee. So right. I just want to... Mm -hmm thank the work that everyone has been doing on this because you know we're all here for the same reason. We're here for our students and we want to focus on our core academic standards but we also want to make sure our students are having the best uh, climate and culture and inclusion and a safe place to be. So if we marry those two together and I think that that's where our goals are going to be in the future not saying what we did in 2021 is wrong. We're just going to review, yeah. shift, and reevaluate, um, but you know, I think that that's where we need to start because I think that that word curriculum is mm -hmm. kind of where everybody's kind of questioning yeah, of what's fine. going on, right? I think you know, and also the words, uh, the the abbreviation SEL, which has been sure. part of PD for 
years. Right. And it's also been part of what we do. Right. Whether people knew it was a label mm -hmm. or not. Right. But the reason why I asked uh, Beth Ann was, um, I mean, I've had <coughs> several examples that have been brought to me already. How long were we in school? Two weeks? Yep. Kids that are in not kindergarten, not mm -hmm. first grade, mm -hmm. second or third grade, they yep. moved to this district, right. and they're not beyond stage one of the Maslow hierarchy right. to learn. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have the emotional learning around supporting them, they're never going to learn. They're never going to meet the benchmarks that we're shooting for. So it's not just about one example of a fifth grader. Right. It's about the growth in our district, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's certainly going to create more diversity and greater needs. And that we have to be able to be prepared to expand, even adjust this plan. Because yeah. I would argue that, and I think I think these numbers are probably accurate based on recent benchmarks. I would argue that maybe yellow gets higher. Yeah, it did. And, we, and instead of developed, I developed the I, I'm not questioning year. you yeah. know more than I do. Right? <laughs> no, I'm just saying though, it's an old this market. is a it's right. a form. This is going to be higher when we find out that kids aren't the 80 to 90 percent of their time or whoever are not functioning in green, and in particular. And, and without disrespecting Natasha, the superintendent who moved in here for a couple of weeks, his number one goal was targeting the earliest interventions. And that's, that's why right. that's uh, right. Peg was, was added. So we're worried about these kids that are coming to school still mm -hmm. in not kindergarten, but first, second, and even third grade. And they're not reading. And they, they don't they have family conflicts that they can't get beyond that basic concerns to even be prepared to learn. In elementary, it's not the traditional everybody we've ever known in Mountain Talk. Agreed. Absolutely, and that was Agreed. that was part of the. Discussion you are the, so right. In the comprehensive. Plan. You are so right. We had those Thank discussions. You. We saw um, our our growth um, in our different populations here just even prior to COVID, and with that, just being in education as long as I have in different districts. We're, I think that the Crestwood community is, is experiencing a shift in their population that a lot of districts have experienced a decade ago. And with that, if you want to keep your same level of academic performance, which is our goal, all of our goals, we have to learn how to shift and meet the kids where they are. And that's, that's the goal of this, because we want them to show up every day ready to learn. But I think we're, we're kind of missing the point here is, I think one of us is talking about student-centered and one of us is talking about teacher-centered. I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct mm -hmm. where we need the framework for mm -hmm. the teachers to yep. understand. I have this child that's going through this. Where is the plan? This mm -hmm. is where I follow the plan. Right. I have this right. incident and this is where I go. I right. think where we're getting mixed up is that we're saying some of us think that it's, it's being into every classroom and that's that's not what this is about and maybe it, it could be looked differently because this looks like this is a, this is a goal for all the students like this right. where we're actually mm -hmm. talking about is the team of right. our teachers need to understand mm -hmm. every support now right. that we have and everybody has a place right. and if there is an issue there is somebody to go to for every right. issue that one of our kids have. I and think it's a streamlined yep. process yep. for them to get right. access to that right. help. And so right. all the teachers are aware, all the staff in the buildings are right. aware. We're constantly using technology to streamline, yep. our, streamline right. our system. This looks like a, a student-centered yeah. map. This, the, this and that's where our conversations were then, because we were worried about our kids being so isolated. So we, we absolutely, right. when you flip this page over, from the side that we were talking about to the other side, it shows you the very adult pieces of where to go for help and what right. kind of support. So I think the, we need the to marry two those just two things. Sure. To, yep. Like whether yep. this is white or we follow this, this right. is this is yep. more of what should yep. be there. We can do that. That's fine. I have a quick question. Based on now, if some, if a child, my child, any mm -hmm. child, is having issues in the classroom, uh, behavioral, mm -hmm. not ready to learn. Mm -hmm. Is that child going to take away from the students who are ready to learn? Who, or are they put into like a supplemental learning classroom? Um, and secondly, if anybody's child moves from tier one to tier two to tier three, mm -hmm. are the parents? Are we notified of that? I can answer that question for you. So we have um, two different oh, levels of. First of all, anyone can request help here yeah. for a yeah. so you can request help. For if we see something at home, hey, I need to yeah. reach out to your guidance counselor. Absolutely. So we meet weekly in the building um, in a process called um, SAP, so it's a student assistance program. And then in the elementary schools, we have child steps. So 
So we, we as a team, is made up of guidance counselors, principal administrators, um, special educators, the teachers, regular educators, mm -hmm. and there's a referral system that we use electronically so we can review the um, referrals that come in. They have a child study process where to start on a student or a student assessment staff were to start, you get paperwork that comes home or a phone call home that lets you know, hey, this is happening, you're invited to the meeting. So that's the parent and okay. then a valuable member of that team. So we call to the table and we talk about, okay, here's what we tried, here's maybe what we didn't try that we didn't think of, and we come up with a plan and we monitor that plan for a little while. So we'll put interventions in place like for trial study. Maybe we'll reduce the number of cells, you know, and see if that helps or reduce minutes of home, whatever it is, we come up with strategies together and we monitor the the, um, the success of those strategies. Mm -hmm. So immediately the goal is to put strategies in place to keep the child in a less restrictive environment and with their regular peers, typical peers, mm -hmm. because that's where kids learn best, with good models. If through that process we see that the child is not making progress, then they get, there's another referral that comes that would refer them to a higher level of evaluation and then development potentially an IEP or some other accommodations thing which could end you know end in them being in a different educational place. That is also cannot move forward without parent consent. So if that process we're gonna have to you get a permission to evaluate that would come home and that would ask for your consent before that process. So none of those things would get into place without the parent being an integral part. Mr. Nardone, you had a question and I asked you to hang on to it for a sec. Yeah, some of it was answered. Um, part of it was just answered. I was wondering what uh, either qualitative or quantitative criteria is used to move somebody from the green to the yellow tier. Um, and is it a team approach? It, yeah, it's very much a team approach. And the data comes from either academic performance or behavioral performance in the classroom. So if they're performing below expectations academically, we would reach out to the child study team process or, or the SAP process if it was a behavioral or, or a outside service need. So there's there's definitely teacher conversation with kid, teacher conversation with parent before anything escalates out of the green level of everybody gets gets the base level of support. And the typical referrals that you'll see through a student assistance process would be, you know, a child who maybe has the need for mental health um, services, drug and alcohol services. Um, if there's truancy, that's often put through that um, that plan because that's usually just the tip of an iceberg. So we love to provide services, and it's it's an entire team that meets weekly. So this is an awful lot of services and resources we're gearing to this tier one level, and then we escalate that as. Students need more help. I would say that the team approach where we're having conversations all the time about kids and where they're at is, is a lot, you know, that's happening very often. The services then are indicated in the percentages you see in the yellow and the red drum. So nobody's getting those services until so they need to move higher up the pyramid. Like as far as mental health or drug, drug I mean, we have some DARE programs and things like that that are universal, but go to all the kids, but um, typically, I will comment that when I saw this on the website, mm -hmm. it, I drew the conclusion inaccurately okay. that this was going on with all the students. Okay. And it's exactly what we, you know, what life is all about. We learn this through living. Mm -hmm. The clarification should probably be more pointed okay. that these are folks that are moving from green to yellow, right. yellow to red, right. and we're not putting yeah. resources. It so, should be you know, reading, writing, and reading. Right. So, yes. I got you. Right. So I'm using education speak, and I need to change my language. I get you. I get you. Right. So maybe it's not tier one. Maybe mm -hmm. tier one is that first es escalation. Yeah. The tier, majority tier of the is, students is normal, everyday right. life. Yeah, this is tier one. This is everybody. This so is, it this should is, be labeled tier one. Right. It should just not be anything. Yeah. Okay. You know, just so people, like I said, parents <laughs> yeah, kind of like right. look at they're like, well, why is every kid now an at risk kid? Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's exactly the right. conclusion you draw. Right. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. That's All right. Exactly that's good feedback. And, and honestly, I I think that's what today is about too, because mm -hmm. there was some questions mm -hmm. that were going on from the board, the community. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and this is why we're here today. Mm -hmm. This is why yeah. we asked um, yeah. Ms. Foster to put together a presentation mm -hmm. was to sure. have these conversations. So again, so okay. this is all great, great guidance, great feedback. It, we're going to have another committee <coughs> meeting within the next couple of weeks, uh, actually, and uh, to cycle back to this. We, this is absolutely stuff that can be a dead. So all amended. this could go on without being in the curriculum. Yeah, and it is as we speak. So why change? I'm not changing. This isn't about change. This is about refining and defining. I see in your plan, it puts it into curriculum, building it in with specific curriculums, K through three, K through second, uh, three through six. To avoid any like smoke and mirrors or any uh -huh. miscommunication, the, the goal was to create a framework around what we were already doing in terms of that golden rule. So right. I, I could share with you and with Mrs. Mazza's, um, so for example, Developmentally, grade one, if we were to say things that they touch upon, develop self awareness and self management skills. So, identify your emotions, name your emotions, name the emotions felt by the characters in a story. So, just talking about developmentally appropriate things at each age level and what kind of things that a roadmap for teachers, to what kind of things they should touch upon in the ultimate goal to get your senior to the point where they're ready to be. Uh, uh, contributing members of society. So there are things that we were trying to roadmap for teachers that were expectations developmentally to mm -hmm. develop a child. So develop self-awareness and self-management skills, like I said, use social awareness and interpersonal schools, uh, skills to establish and maintain positive relationships. That's enough. Like, so there are things that we are already doing, but it's creating a framework and a roadmap for teachers to understand that they're there. Oh. So that was a goal from 2021. And we are shifting, because I think it's still yes. in mm -hmm. discussions. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can happily share with everyone where we were at in the development of it as we are now looking to make changes. Yeah. Just a suggestion for something that I think should be taught is these kids should learn that social media is so, that's not the real life. Yeah. You know, and, and I think they get these false expectations from these social influencers that, oh, I need to be this, that, and that. And then they're crushed when they when they can't be that, and it doesn't prepare them. You know, they they go out thinking, you know, I need to do this and that, and then they get to college or wherever, and it, that's not the way life is. It's a lot tougher. And John, um, excuse me, this is Stephanie again. Um, what you're speaking about is the same exact thing we're speaking about. Real life is not. We're teaching kids the skills to be resilient and recognize that what they see posted is not necessarily reality. So you're right on target if, with that. If that's exactly what we're, we're going with that, that's mm -hmm. fine. I just don't want it to go the other, you know, other way and, you know. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about it, and I think that a lot of the misinformation uses the same terminology that the educators yeah. have been taught to use for a very long time, and I think that it's been picked up and kind of used and abused in the wrong way. So I think it's healthy to have these conversations because it's not it's not something that we're like purchasing something new and then coming in and, and teaching something new. It's just creating a framework around the things that we already do and to ensure that we're we're changing with with the changes that are happening with social media and and growth of population. Okay, I'm, I'm a little confused. Are you teaching them how to behave or are you seeing behaviors and then realizing you have to change the behavior? In which instance? Well, you said K through three, they should be able to So ABC. these are like milestones that a teacher who's teaching a reading, like a reading teacher, she's in there to hit upon, okay, what are the characters in this book? What are they doing? What do you think this space you know, means? So they have, there's goals along the way to hit milestones in terms of in your curriculum that you're already doing, making sure that you're you're touching, okay, this is how you identify an emotion. This is how you get along with people. This is how you might understand someone else's point of view. There are things that are already built into like comprehension a lot of the time in your reading materials and your reading classes, but this is just laying it out in a developmentally appropriate way to say, okay, did you do this? Did you, you know, have you hit these points along the way? The concepts, so it's not something that like, we're not giving them a, a sheet of something to, to work off of and having them Terry, it's it's both. I know what you're talking about. Okay, it's both. So here's my example. Parent, it's my job. It's yeah. my job to teach my child right. how to have emotions and right. how to regulate his emotions and 
That's why I'm mm -hmm. confused whether you're teaching it or if you're just advising it. It's both. Like you're, you're noticing that, and okay, this kid's got something yeah. going on, so and that's, it shouldn't can be we both. get this? We should but here's, here's why. It's both in, in two different areas. First and foremost, it's here's how you walk the hallway, boys and girls. It's not this kind of shoving and pushing going on. Here's how you walk down the hallway. That's the teaching part. This right. afternoon, I was doing it on the school bus. How do we sit on the school bus? Is they're standing up and leaning over the seats. I was like, nope, what's in seats? That's where you have to be. So that was our teaching piece. The Where it becomes both is for the kids that after those kinds of conversations of this is what the expectation is, can't follow through. That's when we rise Correct. to the yellow level and we start to engage parents and say, okay, things aren't going well. We've talked about what the expectations are. How can we work together to make things better? That's where the change is from just parents to just teachers to both parents Correct. and teachers working together because something isn't clicking. If the kid repeatedly is standing up on the seat of the bus, he's going to get hurt. I don't want him to get hurt. I need to do something different. Having them sit down on the seat of the bus isn't working. I need to communicate with the kid, the parent, the teacher, and say, all right, so this isn't happening. We need to escalate our support. And I would automatically do that without picking up this chart and saying to myself, oh, got to go to yellow. I'm like, no, I, because that's who I am. So it's just a matter of knowing where our supports are as teachers and administrators, knowing that we've got the supports available through all of the pieces that, I, did you grab one of those, Terry? I don't have one. Okay, they're floating around here somewhere. On, on this side and of the Peg, page, if, they, if I may just interject, I'm sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Um, when you go to your pediatrician, they ask you, is all the milestone checks? Is your child doing this, doing this, doing this? And they're checking off whether your child is meeting, meeting their developmental milestones. Correct. Correct. Peg, thank you. Um, and they're checking it off. And if you tell your pediatrician, ah, oh, he, he can't sit still. He's running around the house. The pediatrician is going to say to you, okay, let's look at this further. This is the same thing in academics. Are they meeting their developmental milestones or are they delayed? And is there something we can do more? So that's what the tiered levels of intervention are. Or right, what can and we I do understand that. It's just right. that there's this, it was definitely said that we're teaching them, you know, this emotion or whatever. And it's like, you're talking about physical, he's standing on the, he's not behaving in class. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get that completely. Mm -hmm. It makes 100% sense. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about teaching them. Like, you know, do the whole, they feel about this. What should they do about this? I don't see how that is a... Uh, I, 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 I think as a former teacher, you need both and... and John was a student in my math classes. And John, I, I, I think a guideline, the teachers need both. I was taught how to teach math. That's what they taught me in college. You took one, one course in behavioral psychology. They didn't really target it. Everybody in, in that class was not going into education and whatever. You had me for calculus. I had a calculus AP class where I had kids on two sides of the room. One came from a, uh, the Mideast where a friend of his got killed in front of his eyes. I had two guys with veins bulging in their neck as they're yelling at each other. I've got to know how to handle that and how to relate to that. I had two students throwing books across the room at each other on a lower level. And I think... We needed big interventions there. And just learning how to teach math isn't going to do it anymore. You've got to be able to have a system in place. And it's got to start low and work its way up because you've got, you've got to handle all these situations. And it might not be we're embedding it directly into the curriculum, but it's still got to be there. It's got to be taught. And, and as a professional teacher, You've got to learn how to deal with this, learn what your resources are, and all that. So there definitely has to be a co-mingling of these two. You can't just go in and teach math. It's not going to work. 
not going to work. Okay, but everyone matures differently. They have a different, I mean, everyone matures differently. So how do you know that student A is totally okay with it, but yet student B might be really freaked out by what you're trying to present because they're not emotionally ready for it. Yep, Terry, that's why this isn't just a, a one-stop shop. Okay. There's, there's many different pieces of this puzzle. As you see on the back of that chart, there's many different levels of support, and it's not just one thing happening. It's it, let's get together as a team. Let's talk about what this kid is showing us and, and what we need to do to help make things better. And as the kids get older, they're included in those conversations. So it's not just, uh, you know what, I can give you an x-ray kind of approach. It's definitely a global look at each individual kid based on where they are and what they need. Mr. Gore, so, go ahead. Yeah, so I think sitting back and kind of hearing everybody's points um, from an educational perspective, and just to kind of summarize a comprehensive plan, because I've written several of them. So this is a plan, and it's exactly what it is, and just so we're clear, none of this has been implemented yet. So it's in the planning stages. Was the plan initially to implement a K through 12 SEL curriculum? Absolutely. Have we implemented one? No, we have not. Do we think that we need to pivot and change that plan? Absolutely, and we're not too prideful that we're not going to say we need to pivot and change that. The term curriculum is delivery of instruction, and that is would be what we're putting in place that we want our teachers to deliver to students. And that's not what we want to build, so we need to pivot and change that whole planning of curriculum. Sure. We need to build a multi-tiered system to take what we're already doing and make it better and just build on it, because we're doing amazing things with mental health right now, yeah. but we're not going to implement, and I, I mean, I am not comfortable implementing an SEL curriculum right telling teachers what to deliver to students. Right. That's not yeah. our goal, and I think that our terminology came across wrong, mm -hmm. but at this point, none of that's been implemented. Correct. That is in the planning stages, we're right. only at the midpoint. Yeah. But uh, I think that's where the difference in yeah. curriculum right. and, yeah, and building on our right. overall right. plan of it. We still want to address, it's not like when John's talking, it's not like either we're going to do it or we're not, because you know, Stephanie is saying, well, our kids' needs are important. We know they're important. It's not either we're doing it or we're not doing it. We're addressing their needs, but we're not going to teach the kids how to act and how to behave. It's not our job to teach right. things that parents should be teaching them at home. This technically should be invisible. Correct. Mm -hmm. this, this should not, like, it should not be curriculum. It should be even on, you know, in a, in a plan. It should be meetings you have with teachers who say if you see this do this or here's a here's here's a to-do or a, what if this happens this it, you know and I think that's where it's scaring people because they think this is now instead of math reading science we're gonna focus on social we're gonna focus on yeah. behavior and it really this should just be something that you guys talked about in the teachers' meetings and going forward and then and, there is an issue to talk to the parents. And do you know what? Our teachers already are doing that. And that's great. That's great. But this just, this is kind of putting it out there like we're going to, we're, we're pushing this. You know, we're pushing I think so the hang-up is the word curriculum because everything we're talking about is already being done um, by our Frontline staff, our teachers, and, and, that's and that's recognizing that's as administration that we need to support that and mm -hmm. offer even more. But I think the hang up is the word curriculum. Mr. Nardo? So most of us that are not educators look at the grand percentage of the population, 85, 90 percent, mm -hmm. you deal with curriculum. Then you have exceptions. Mm -hmm. Just get those exceptions. Yep someplace else you know you guys do it internally but the curriculum should really be focused on the great majority of the population yeah. call it curriculum this is what yeah. we teach our kids For sure. and those that can't learn identify them as exceptions and move them to the yellow or red yeah. but that doesn't have to be in 
the confines of the term curriculum because that's it doesn't go over well with Palmer. Gotcha. Okay. Please remember two things. One, this this was a conversation. This is the outcome of a conversation that was in the throes of COVID where we were very, very concerned about ourselves, about our families, about our kids, about our students and our society. We're emerging from that situation now and our feelings are different. Please realize the second part of this. This is a plan, as John said, as we, we've all talked about. Plans are just that, things that are guides and roadmaps and are absolutely changeable. So we can certainly adapt this and move forward. So, nah, no problem. So let's what? move on before we, so that we can uh, see the rest, okay? So, the second piece is to look at those social supports around career development because this piece is individualized also. The career development components are really the connector to your future is our goal. So we work on career conversations with kids as young as elementary schools and that's you know, talking about what do firefighters do, what does a forester do, what's a pediatrician do, what does a, a, a metal worker do, what's an electrician do. And we have career development conversations as young as kindergarten, first grade in books. And uh, these conversations are really important because it helps kids think about where they want to go beyond high school and that your future is our goal is a reality for all of our kids. So we've got systems in place to not only help kids look at what careers are, but also to track what kind of ideas they had and how they changed over time because Designing a portfolio is part of the graduation project that's a requirement for students to, to leave us, but also being able to say, I tried this, it really worked for me, I love it, I'm going to go do that. Or, I tried this, it really was not what I thought it was, I'm going to do something else and move forward. So, the career development piece is, is a smart and absolutely helps us stay on track. Um, Instructional technology, this also is, is a real important conversation that we needed to have. Remember, we were in the throes of COVID and everything was technology based. But I also want you to remember this, that we are, as a district, ahead of where we thought we needed to be through many of the pieces that happened here in this boardroom. The infusion of technology across our district, the improvements in infrastructure, changes to Promethean boards. Um, this has been a, a, shining a shining star of our comprehensive plan. We've done nice jobs here. The things that I think are important over time will be how to blend the personal touch with the technology touch. Because you know that your neck hurts after a while from sitting <coughs> on the computer all day. We have, to, we have to continue to work on a blend of that. This piece, um, was the financial piece and this one is is sort of painful for us because the conditions changed outside of COVID so once again when we were in the beginnings of COVID this is what our business manager talked about wanting his targets to be a financial outlook of our district and change the financial outlook of Pennsylvania and the nation so we're going to need to examine this and take another hard look this is not remember it's a plan this is where we were 18 months ago it's not where we are now. We'll have to consider that and move forward to. So there are more than one piece of this that, that needs adjustments. So where are we headed? Um, in short, I think we're doing a really nice job of staying connected to what our big picture is. Our big picture is our students' future beyond Crestwood. I think we're doing a real nice job of keeping track of student in uh, student performance. We're doing a real nice job of giving the kids that need the support the support. We're doing a real nice job around career readiness and career planning. Tech infrastructure is growing and growing stronger every day. Financial stability and some of this SEL component we're going to do some adjustments with. And that makes sense. Things are changing. I may have missed it. I was on the phone. But that, how are you measuring the career readiness piece? That we're, us that we're using a software platform called Zello, and students will go through, um, there's two sides to that. One is 
lessons that show them this is what this field looks like. Um, and the other piece is the performance portfolio that they do after going through a module. So my best example is um, there was a, a conversation about what the health services field looks like. So in that conversation, the kids had to say, I, you know what, pediatrics is my, my thing. Geriatrics is, is something that I'm interested in. Or I want to be a surgeon. What does, what does that look like? So when they went through that module, then they had to complete a survey and answer some questions and give some feedback. And it starts to develop a portfolio that guides them into more experiences online to look at that. Now, the fun thing is that based on those feedbacks, the guidance counselors <coughs> and myself are looking at other ways that we can get them job experiences. Um, I have a contact with a, a local gentleman who's trying to help us get some of our anatomy and physiology classes into a medical rotation. Um, we've got some kids that have gone down to the bio class, uh, the bio lab at Wilkes to go through the cadaver lab to actually test out, is, is surgery really my thing or not? Can I handle doing a little bit of work on a cadaver? So those are the kinds of things that Zello opens the door for us. When we see kids that have an interest in an area, we start to find those other places that they can go. I, I did miss the part. What, I, we talked about this before. When are they getting introduced to Zello? What grade? Starting in fourth. Okay. I just wanted to make yep. sure because I, I'm a big believer, and I think yep. I said this from when I started mm -hmm. on the board. I asked about the Chapter 339 yep. plan, yep. which was dusty yep. and old, yep. and then the pandemic mm -hmm. hit. Yep. They have to be introduced yep. at the youngest grades yep. for career, even if it's just filling out forms yeah. and exploring. Right. Um, but the more we could interview, uh, we were a couple people in the mm -hmm. industrial park. They're thrilled to, to be partners on career opportunities that maybe we couldn't do the last year or year and a half or whatever. But I think we need to at least start at the youngest ages mm -hmm. about, about exploration. Yeah. The Zello piece will start with fourth grade as young as, as K to three in our past lives. And Kevin, I'm not sure where we are with junior achievement at this point in our lives, but there was a point when junior achievement was coming into the school, the elementary schools and talking with our little guys about, this is, this is what we do. This is, I'm an accountant and this is what I do as an accountant. I think that's great. It's not really data driven at those youngest grades about sell off what these kids are filling out because yep. we could track that by the time they yep. graduate and how their thoughts evolve yeah but at least they have an establishing point yep at that youngest age about what they're interested in and then can follow all the paths whether it's whether it's the uh you know the college prep or career ready yep well, that's the spirit yeah. of the whole thing right the research shows right. that people were leaving high school spending all this money Front of their education, the find out at the end of their education. They really have any interest in that. Yeah. They just wasted that. Their parents made them do it. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe so. I'm I'm maybe it's a terminology issue, but I'm I'm struggling with the readiness piece uh, because I I'm thinking to in my mind, career education is different than career readiness, and mm -hmm. are we circling back with uh, recent graduates to see mm -hmm. are they mm -hmm. changing majors once they get to college yes. or do they pick something that they did not realize yep. having two recent graduates I did not find that they had a lot of um, mentorship or fostering into a career field I, I felt that they basically found their path on their own. And that may be strictly my experience, uh, but to, to use the term career readiness, I think implies a little bit more than 
educating them on options. Um, it, I would be more interested in, because we found that some of the things that kids gravitate to are um, what they are exposed to. Right. Uh, so is it truly what they're exposed to, or is it because there's a, a deep uh, passion for something? And, and pulling that passion out through, uh, you know, what I would consider aptitude tests mm -hmm. or, or surveys to find out, you know, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess mm -hmm. I'm just, I want to make sure that when we say career readiness, that we are truly trying to help mm -hmm. them yeah. find their way. Agreed. And Agreed. And Agreed. On, on kind of on that point, on, to me on the other side of the career readiness are, mm -hmm. can they then get into the program they want to get into? Right. I feel like we have no information. Are the kids getting into the colleges they want? Like, do we have a lot of kids or programs? I mean, not right. even college, different mm -hmm. tech programs. Or, are they getting in or are we getting a lot getting turned down and maybe yes they're going to college or a program but it's really not the one they wanted it's just the one they can get into yes and i really feel that can give us so much information of are we do we have the right curriculum like do are, right or are the kids even being educated properly of the classes that they would have needed to get into these different programs so so John, i would really like us to start to to start kind of you get the guidance department to get to some of that data i know they yeah. collect it yeah, I, I would love to, you know, and if we're already collecting it, that's great, you know, but I'd like to know that are we lining, are we lining up? You know, are most of the kids getting where they need to be? And if not, why? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, like I said, our next meeting of the Comprehensive Planning Committee is September 22nd. If you're interested in joining this committee, because some folks have stepped off. Um, because they've moved from one place to another, and I think that dog wants to join us. <laughs> so... Um, anyway, if you're interested in joining, please email me at uh, my email address, and I will send you the the information regarding this, the next comprehensive planning meeting. But I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Just a bender item for academics. Not a question. Just informational. I know most of the people in the room are aware of this. They're turning you on. Um, I'm going to send you today because we won't have another work session before this happens. But on October 5th and 6th, we have our Distinguished alumni award ceremonies for the dinner on the fifth, and then an assembly on the sixth. And that's why I'm here. Um, we're recognizing Jenny Zayshell, class of '86, and Ori Shakara, class of '67, to the International um, Finance. So I want everyone to be aware of it. The media, you'll get an invite at 10 on, the, on Thursday, and hopefully we'll get some attention. Thanks to everyone in this room who's been a part of it. And the other thing I want to make a point that everyone understands. About one taxpayer dollar goes in. It's 100 percent subsidized by sponsors, private donors. I'm on a meeting. Thank you. We're supposed to attend, Stephanie, but I didn't attend Stephanie, in person. Stephanie, can you mute yourself, please? We can hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> on academics, I'd like to follow up on my last committee. How are we planning and adjusting for our math improvements in the middle school? Are we yes. monitoring at our middle or high? Middle and height. And high. Okay, I thought high was the. Well, the eight. I'll let me circle back. So. I, thought, I know. I just thought we. I thought we had a plan for that. I thought it was the high school we did. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I'd be open to any okay. plan. <laughs> so I'd be open to it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so the plan is it, it's universal, middle all the way through high school. It's it's basically. Um, you know, kind of addressing that whole department um, because we feel like the needs at in seventh grade, you know, developed in sixth and, and the dip we saw from COVID, but those, some of those students from two or three years ago are now in ninth and tenth. So we have needs across the board. So we met with all of our departments in the first couple of days in service. Math was our, our biggest and, and most important focus. Uh, but we met with all of them. Um, the, the math department is super energized and, and we stress the importance of we have to move these kids in the right direction. So with that said, I met with a representative from the intermediate unit. Um, he provided me with data from years of math. Um, 
statistics. So I have to break that down. The individual student scores for math from last year's tests haven't been released yet. So it's basically just a, an overall uh, breakdown. Once I get that data, I'm going to provide that uh, to the teachers, and they're aware of this, so that they can focus on weaknesses and strengths of individual kids. And that's what I've been stressing, that we need to become more student-centered instead of school-centered delivery of instruction. We need to focus on even our high flyers, not just our students that are, are low. We have students that, that don't get what they need because they're so high, and we're just focusing on the middle. So, you know, that's our message. We also, I also met with another rep from the IU um, for the implementation of a new diagnostic test, which is classroom diagnostic testing, which is the CDTs. Um, they've come a long way since we've used them 10, 15 years ago. They're much more user friendly. There's over 50 different tests developed. The feedback is immediate, so the teachers will get immediate feedback. Um, they can do them on Chromebooks. They're 15 minute. Um, tests, diagnostic tests. So they would take them, and our plan is to take as soon as we can. We're, we're going to implement them probably within the next two weeks. So we have a baseline, um, and then we're going to do them uh, quarterly throughout the year and circle back and see where the strengths and weaknesses are. When we do find those weaknesses, that's where we're going to push them into those intervention times, which is the study halls, um, because we feel like that time that we have built in there, if there's not a plan, it's basically worthless. So we know the importance of building a plan there, but now our plan is to take the, the strengths and weaknesses from those diagnostic tests and use that to build our instruction in those, in those times. So we have a lot of things planned. Um, I just pushed all that information out yesterday to the math department, and the feedback was tremendous. They're, they're <coughs> super excited that they're Finally, getting a lot of attention on them, so and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna put those. But it's it's super important that we get data. We have to look at where our students' strengths and weaknesses are on specific anchors within the testing. You know, we're obviously teaching well to the test and teaching our students well to be successful. But somewhere there's something because our scores are low. This will give us that feedback early on in the year. Yeah, the, the, the plan is was always to, to use diagnostic testing with your students. Now, the old CDTs were about an hour oh, yeah. each. I'm so uh, we were throwing it out there. Okay. Ms. Weichoff, could you please mute yourself? Fire. Stephanie, could you please mute it's yourself? Terrible. I'm calling them out. Stephanie. I'm calling them out. Yeah, so the plan was always to use data and diagnostic tests. The old CDTs were about an hour long, so you end up over testing your students. Now the diagnostics are 15 minute uh, short, short bursts, so you get a lot more feedback, and the teachers don't need to break it down by entire grade span, it's just like a classroom. I'll so call, I'll they go could and call. use their Chromebooks, say, what, what's going on, we're doing this right. diagnostic right. today on algebraic equations. Is that for Lauren? Seven. No, shut it off. Put Lauren so, so are you able to see from those at a higher level, so the teachers are able to see that their individual class? Are you able to see across the classes to see if there's something in general? Yeah, I mean, the concept if, if, that we're missing. Yeah, I mean that's that's my job to look at the overall um, data from those tests mm -hmm. and see which anchors we're weak in. And I and I'm not pointing the blame at anybody below them, but everything kind of flows uphill. And maybe we're missing an anchor in sixth grade, and 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 it's not because they're not teaching. You know, with fidelity, and they're not teaching hard. Right. Every test because they are. It could be a hundred reasons, but if there's one piece that's missing, that'll we're that's missing it for some that reason. Right. 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 We have to identify and figure out why, and, and then we'll you know we'll meet as a team and we'll. In, in short, short burst yeah. tests like that, and not having to wait for a benchmark after four or five months, and having all that lost time, mm -hmm. that's when the CDT is going to be able to do us, mm -hmm. so we can have action immediately. And having only 15, you know, having to be able to take that 15 to 20 minutes 
that's not it's not something so comprehensive that it, that it will take a teacher or educator two or three weeks to put a plan together how to teach and get back to that anchor or what we missed. Now we can get back to it the next day or the day after. The energy he spoke about earlier from our teachers, our math department, they're excited about what we're able to do within those class sizes, those seventh and eighth grade class sizes, to cut them down in half. That gives them that extra opportunity to now be student individually centered, be able to answer those benchmarks that they may be missing. And now we're seeing that in a monthly period. Is it going to be a two, two week period? And that's what we can decide to be able to use that effectively. Energy is there, which is great, and now being able to align schedules with those teachers because of how we were able to break those down. They have more communication, and I think that goes to answer your question as well, Mr. Macri, is when they have communication there, they get a chance to see here's the umbrella that's not working for Mr. Dorman. He had identified it with your well, and we can get that impact in the meeting. So I, I think what we have started, what we've recognized, we have a nice plan for the care of getting into. Um, is there any other questions on the academic committee from the board or the public? No? Nope. Okay, then I uh, look that we adjourn. adjourn. Uh, thank you. Technology, Mrs. Bibla. Uh, roll call, uh, Ms. McCurdy, Ms. Campbell, here. I make a motion to approve the minutes of August 11, 2022. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We do not have any agenda items this month. Does anyone have an open discussion for technology? Are we good on Chromebooks? Um, no, okay. with, so Mrs. With all McCurdy the should have an update. Her yeah, know. Oh, okay. so she, okay. she, I don't have cell phone service if someone okay. else so can call I will it. Call Mrs. Okay. Just give me a minute. So I can, I How's our internet service? Has it improved with our new provider? So the Wi Fi works, just my personal phone isn't mm -hmm. working. <laughs> the Verizon. Well, we're dead in the water. For I, I'm hearing time. that the internet <laughs> service is okay. a little slower oh, than normal. That was at the IU, something. So it wasn't on. And particularly, I heard it's really slow in the um, uh, yeah, no, HR no, director no, solicitor no. area. Oh, oh, very slow. Oh, okay. So it'll be on my computer. Yeah, that's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why I don't do my That's okay. right. <laughs> <laughs> so like he, he sends me emails that I don't get. <laughs> and then I get yelled at. all emails. Answer me. I think there's not all the students have Chromebooks yet. Is that, I didn't know if that was something we were working on and just a matter of rolling them out, or if there, I didn't know if there was an issue. Yeah, there Okay. Um, there is a teacher process to, to get through everyone. Um, I was told by tomorrow everyone will have their account. Okay. Okay. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Nope. That was the only question I had. Unless someone okay. else. Any Is other questions? There? You can mute yourself now if you want until they're ready okay. for you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Questions from the public? Positive behavioral intervention, Mrs. Bibla. Mr. Nardone. Here. Ms. Campbell. Here. I make a motion to approve the minutes of August 11, 2022. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. We have one agenda item to move to the agenda. Um, I have one question on it. So, our social worker is going to be starting October 1? 3rd. 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 She will also need this training as well. She's currently staff training. She already has it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's it. Any other questions from the board? What's SAP? A student assistance program. And Ms. Betchel, what part of the district is she in? Oh, support. I can do that. Okay. Any questions from the public? Seeing none, I'll make a motion to move item one to the agenda. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Do we have right. any open discussion? Just for clarity on that, we have other staff that are being trained in November as well, but this is an opportunity that's prior to the November date, and it would be for our officer and our emotional support to take the student leave out of the better position to get it as soon as possible. Okay. Open discussion? Seeing none, close positive behavior. Physical plant and construction committee, Mrs. Haddix. I'll call a uh, committee to order. Um, I am present, Mr. Grobna. Here. Mr. Macri. Present. All members present. I will ask for approval of the minutes <coughs> for the August 11th physical plant and construction committee meeting. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There are no agenda items. Uh, we do have the feasibility study as an open discussion. Uh, I think with additional information um, from our last meeting, I think it may be prudent to move forward with the feasibility study now knowing that it will encompass all district buildings, um, as well as having additional information about future growth opportunities. Is there any questions or comments from the committee or board? Cost? The, uh... What would the cost be? The cost is 12500 That was already included in the budget for this year in, in this committee. Uh, and I think, I think we need this to decide where we're going. Uh, what the, We talked with this firm uh, back in the spring, uh, very interested in gathering all the information. We told them we would provide them with the hunt study which is, was like from 2015, somewhere in that era. And they can see what that study said needed to be done in the district, what has been done in the district. Being district-wide, look at growth. Uh, they're interested in talking to even local contractors. I have information, a, a person, I had a phone call about a year ago person interested in developing 150 units within the school district. Is the school district ready to handle this? That person was from out of the area, from California, by the way, but I still have his phone number, his personal phone number. And this is a type of information that, uh, as far as future growth, that the uh, feasibility study group would be looking at, the Schrader group. Uh, we've had discussions with local developers uh, and I think we need to know exactly where we're headed uh, our last one with naturally COVID interfered but I, I think we, we've got to get a true picture of where we are what our needs are and uh, if there is to be development of any kind be it a new building or reconfiguring and and upgrading our present buildings to get the funding from the state you need to go through your feasibility group of study you need to get that done to be eligible I believe for reimbursement partial reimbursement so if we do need these upgrades or, or new buildings or whatever we need number one identify what we need and number two be eligible for the funding and then we can uh, I, I think uh, by going through that being eligible for the funding we can start to dissolve some of our financial present financial issues uh, by getting a restructuring and borrowing bonding whatever you have to do but I, I think it would be a wise move and the longer we put this off you know the further behind I think we're falling that's and my personal view. The feasibility study is required in order to go to the next step of such a, a plan. And just as you had said, um, it could be the answer to our financial situation and address so many of our infrastructure challenges. Does this company have an end date of when proposed they would be done in so many months? And how many times is the board or the committee going to be updated with a, a presentation 
throughout the whole time because COVID in, interrupted the last one and we got half <coughs> these this, little presentations. This, they did discuss that with us. They also would love to come in and talk with the community, make presentations to the board and the community, get community input so that it's a community issue. It's not just a school board issue, okay? What does this community want? What does this community need? What can we afford? And so on. So there would be public meetings along the way before a, a final presentation is made. I, uh, I have to be in the auditorium. Hmm? So, so this would be more of a master plan. <laughs> Correct. This isn't really a feasibility study. It's a master plan. It's a, it, it's a feasibility uh, in the sense that uh, what, what can we, what are our needs right. and what can we afford to do? Okay. As they well at, as. They look at, at, at county birth rates. They look population at growth. population growth and things of that nature and, and what kind of uh, things do we have going on? Are we going to have more, more students returning to campus because of COVID? Is our enrollment going up? Is our enrollment going down? Do they look at like, like township wide? Like what are what are plans that are being submitted now that's coming up? They, they, that they want to all meet those? with uh, all all townships, all uh, all nine entities within the district. Okay. Yeah, that that's their plan is to to look at the whole thing, not just part of it. And they're gonna look at all the buildings. All the buildings all are the buildings, included. All the buildings yes. Included. And then do they give? Is the idea that they're gonna come out with one plan or they're Going to give us options. They, they usually, I've been through this before, usually they come back with options. Okay, and again, uh, with a lot of input from, from the community, they can say, well, this looks like your best option, uh, but that's what we need is those options presented to us entirely. Have we checked back with them since our last meeting? I have updated them. It was on the agenda. We tabled it, so they are aware that it was tabled, and that I'd be in touch with them as soon as you know we were ready to move forward. So they this is a bigger way. scope than what we talked to them about, or what they talked to us about. So as long as they're on board with that same price, looking at this compared to what mm -hmm. at that time what we looked at. I'll, I'll make a note to notify them, and if there's a change in price, we'll have it before the board. If, if the board decides to put it for a vote. Make a, make a motion to move it to, to okay. the agenda. Uh, I will make a motion and I will ask for a second to move that to the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, there are no other uh, open discussion items on the agenda. Is there anything else from the board? I had some Um is it possible to look into getting a different switch for the stadium lights? Right now, the switch is on a breaker. And I guess it's just within time that this thing is not going to last much longer. It may blow. And it's an antiquated switch at this point. Can we get a, a remote switch, a regular light switch, something? Could an electrician come in and look and possibly present to the board how much that would actually cost. We talked about this That's about a year quite ago, a while yeah. ago. And then that way we could give Dean remote access. Um, right now he doesn't give this the key to many people just because it, it is something that he's worried about. Because okay. the, if this the lights go, then... on our list quite a while ago. Nope. Yeah, that's, and, that's been around for a lot of years. Um, are you talking about the main lights of the stadium? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, every electrician that has seen that says that's not the way it should be done. Um, it's not going to be cheap to do it the way it should be, but we can definitely get three electricians in here and give us ballpark prices on what it is to do. It's going to be expensive, I know that. Yeah, I think it has to be done. I, I know one year we plugged a heater in and the press blocks and the scoreboard went out. And yeah, I, that's a different city. That's a different <laughs> but but at that, we need an upgrade. We can get we can get those in. Please and have then, them. Adjust. I mean, that should be a Wi-Fi enabled switch, so that for the lights, so people don't have to physically go down and do it. Right, and it could be 
enabled yeah. so the administrator could have the ability to turn it on and off from their house. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's not a breaker, yeah. it's not a breaker. Yeah. It's, it's like in your house, you don't want to turn right. on off. But those breakers feed into this Wi Fi switch. They and I have one in my house. It, it, That's what's needed. It, just the wiring to that switch, the switch is really cheap and I'm hoping the Wi Fi reaches there. So it should reach at the it reaches at the field house. So well, I'm sure they can boost, boost it. Yeah. <clears throat> the second thing is that I know we've talked about it before, but we need some sort of railing on the on the stage. We on those at least on one set of the stairs. I don't know how much it would be, or but I mean we have a lot of people coming to all games now, and we have a lot of elderly trying to get up and down the stadium is very hard and our ramp is the furthest part of the stadium mm -hmm. at this point point. and then the other thing is that there are kids running up and down the ramp the entire game where the people are sitting in the wheelchairs they're the ones that can't stand up and see the game there so we just we need to look at how much those handrails would be. and i think we also uh, discussed that quite a while ago um mr brummage did you ever remember looking into railings on the bleachers down there? Um, no. Not putting them up, going up the right up the up center. The stairs. Like yeah. even if we just picked one part of the the home field and really the away field at this point too, at the wayside that we just if we don't if we don't have enough money for all of them, at least just one side in one section. You're gonna have Everybody, you know, over the age of 40 using that side, we guarantee it. Okay. We, we do I have, I've able. seen information from years ago when they talked about yeah, upgrading the, the grandstands. So we can pull out and we can ask for a price to section it out and mm -hmm. say, can you give us a price to do section one, two, three? And I mean, it could be a, a fundraising thing. It, it could be something that the teams look at. We could say, you know, listen, I, I would buy it for my grandpa. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I, I may something like that. You know, it, it could be, it could be an option. But I would just like to see how much it would be, and if if it would be sturdy for the state. So I heard you mention the ramps too. Are, are we are so we the, expanding them or adding? No, them? No, it's just that during at? the games, there's people that sit. There's that section right there we have where the wheelchairs can go up the ramp. So the people that are sitting in the wheelchairs, we have kids running up and down the ramp. For the whole game, and the it's the people that sit in the wheelchairs. They're not the ones that can stand up and see the game. So we just have to be I'll, aware. I'll talk to our police officer tomorrow. Yeah. Make sure he was very active at our first game. So in fact, I'll be I, I can see that the run city. Okay. So I'll make sure he gets over there. Okay. We have to plan for laminate signs. Mm -hmm. We're going to put three signs to at least try to inform what we're looking for to not be right. So we do have a plan. Anything else from the board? Yes. Where are we? Parking lot update, Fairview, Rice. Where are we on the sewer? Where are we on the facade? Where are we on the stage? Um, I, I, I've sent out most of the numbers to the building and grounds committee where it comes to paving to see what the prices are for paving. That's where we're at with that. Um, we, we fixed what we could um, just recently at Fairview. They had a big, huge crack down in the middle of their front parking lot and filled that just to get us through the winter. The next stage for paving is to decide. The board has to decide what we want to do. Kevin, what was done in Fairview, is it getting us through to the next phase, or do we do need to do something more right now? I sent a picture the other day. So where their bus is, so your circle, where your bus mm -hmm. is parked, it forms a river. So where they put that hot patch is still today, right now, underwater. It's not going so to it's going to pop the minute it freezes. It, it's not, it won't be, it probably won't make it to the freeze because you've got buses driving over it every day. So just to, I'm not trying to be doomed yet. So no, but the hot patch in, do you remember? Mm -hmm. uh, Kind enough to rain on us for Thursday school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the fourth and the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> so one day it really rains. The so kids couldn't see how deep the holes were. Mm -hmm. Whoosh. Down, down, down. It's, it's 
say, well, why didn't you move the buses up? It's never good to change your bus positions. They, they would walk into the woods if we didn't put the bus <laughs> in the same spot. So it's very important that they go to the same place. So, so we need to do more. It, 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 has, to, it has to go up. But I, I, Mr. Berman was kind enough to share the cost and fee. It's, I think I don't, yeah. there's no halfway at this point. Yeah, we we need a lot of work. I, I, yeah, that I, was the worst part. I, I've made statements. I, I pulled into both elementary buildings last spring. I, I pulled into Rice, and it was like Swiss cheese, mm -hmm. holes all over. What I didn't see when I pulled into Fairview was the big problem, which I pulled in like a week or two ago. And usually, when I pull in, the parking lot is full. School had not started. I only like section as big as what we have in front of us here, right in the middle of the parking lot, with no asphalt at all. It's gone. And I didn't realize that because it was usually cars parked on it. That thing is an absolute, the whole thing over at, at Fairview is an absolute mess. Yeah, the contractors did realize that, and that's why they told us we, you can't patch this. You can't, it it's to just redone. too big. And anything there, we don't have the equipment to fix. We have to go out uh, beyond what we just filled the holes so people don't break. And we through. do have a price to fix it. Yes, we, yeah, we, or we, yeah. Are we, we broke out the sections. Broke out. Out. Now we have to decide, do we want to put, I think, and then each section is even over the price, we have to put that out in public too. The thing that's slightly upsetting is what was most recently repaid is in the worst condition. And when was that paid? Uh, uh, when Ted was there. Yeah. So we're talking probably 2014. So that so very section that I just right. spoke of. Right. So that gets back to a specification that needs to be written and adhered to by a contractor. So to say patching, patching is not universal. Um, thickness, base, all of those are components that that specification needs to be written, um, whether it is by a, a professional uh, paver or by an engineer. So I think we can't cut loose the proposal that we have based on the dollar amount. So whether we get a, a second bid uh, that is truly apples to apples, um, or could we find what money are we able to devote to paving, have either Tony or Barry Islet write a spec for what type of pavement needs to be utilized and do that much for that dollar amount and see where it gets us. I'm thinking either of those options in order to just somehow move forward. Um, but you've got to at least spend some money. I think so. HK may have put the specs in that pretty much to what he was pricing. We could use those. He figured we would use those. He said, you guys will have to put this out for good. So at least there's some specs there. And I believe when it was done years ago, there was specs of how deep it should be went. When they did rice, they had to come back because it just kind of melted away. The, the, the circle out front where the buses were there. That was like after a year or two. Put it it's Foster. Is just real quick. Is there any urgent paving need oh. at right? Yes, there is. Okay. And it's not a significant yeah. yes, But if we're going to move forward and find some money and bid something, we might as well make sure we cover both emergent needs. Mm -hmm. Now, this now obviously the time of year this is probably not going to get done. Oh, they might do it here. Yeah, I mean, we might. I mean, it's it all possible. depends on how long yeah. it stays warm and then asphalt plants stay open. Exactly. Yeah, we should easily have till December till a plant closes. So we should have time if we can get on it quickly. The other thing for consideration is the amount of parking that's there. I remarked before when we grew our program, we grew exponentially the number of adults reporting and drive. And in that is also the play surface, which is not where people park, but obviously where we play, which is in disrepair as well. And I think that will go along with the master facility plan, um, quantifying uh, occupant load of buildings and how many parking spaces are required. 
So moving forward with us, then how did you want to do it? Do you want to get the other company? That so I think we need to identify what money we have available to devote to this, whether we want to go through, we already have an idea of what we're looking at. And if that can be found, then that's an option. But if that is impossible, maybe we go with a, a spec and just writing a spec to a, a generic amount and see how far it gets us based on a dollar figure. But I'm thinking that could be worked out through administration. And then start and with then the highest back. priority areas. Is there a reason though it hasn't even lasted seven years? Just to, so you know the area, you, you turn, you come in, and the circle where the bus is. That's the only area that was paved recently. And that is the, worst the area thing. that is in most disrepair. And I don't know, because I wasn't at Fairview at the time, why they stopped. But just so everyone has a mental yeah. picture of where, where we're talking about. But the agree. reason Barry Isaac said we're having the issues is because of water, water runoff and drainage. And pitch so that's why they were saying, and they did it for us back in whatever year it was, I had, we had the information, where they planned it all out and it was redoing the drainage systems and, and the water runoffs before just doing the paving. Um, and then I don't know whatever happened with that. It stalled when they started. So now if we just come in and say, can you guys dig this up and pave it? We're going to have the same problem again five, six years down the line because we didn't address the water issues. And a lot of times, paving companies won't address the underlying water issues where an engineering firm would. Now, they cost more money to bring in and they have to do it. Uh, they're going to say, okay, you can build, you know, we'll build it up and pave over it, but it's, we can't guarantee how long it's going to last. That's what these contractors have been telling me. And and I, think, I think this could be. Talking long range tied into feasibility. But we need to at least minimally do the band aid, mill it, right. repave it to get us. Yeah, through. What, well, yeah, what HK gave us, what you saw right. in the numbers I sent. And they broke we, it and we can't have what we're hearing. It's cold patch. Can I be cold patch no. by? No. Our step. Mm. No. So that's our big paving, long standing issue. Um, the brick wall renovation, uh, we have a pre-construction meeting tomorrow, and they plan on starting next week. Um, we'll work out the logistics to minimize any interference with school operations, buses, kids. That paving would be weekend paving? For the paving? Yeah. I would. Yes. It was, you just write yeah. it in the spec. It's going to be a Saturday, yeah. Sunday. And then, of course, the cost will be built in, as you know. Um, the sewer problem outside, because of the magnitude of it and what it takes to fix, we can't do it during school. Fury Eyes was out here the other day, and we're looking for them to even crane over the machinery excavating machinery that can't do it while the kids are in the school so there's a lot of things tied to that so that is um, going to be pushed back into the spring and he's currently working up pricing and options for us um, the other under under the art room um, they just touched on that when the other Penn State mechanical looked at it they saw an issue there but it's not they didn't see that as the worst part if they just said this is part of the other issue. But that's a whole other ball game that we're gonna have to have that reviewed again to see if it's really an issue that they have to go in and dig up the entire concrete floor out of that art room. And that's a major undertaking. <laughs> so if we don't have to do it, Stacy even said maybe if it's not that bad under there, they can sleep, they can do something to get around that. But they were looking at options of taking that sewer around the school and them just eyeing it up, thinking of all the uh, asphalt and concrete that would need to be dug up and relayed. Are you gonna? Are we gonna monthly rotor rooter that sewer line? Yeah, um, we're gonna have it uh, scheduled, and we're gonna keep it cleaned out so we don't run into the backup issue. Um, 
ever since I've been here, we've had drain problems. We've had to clean them out because of the age of the terracotta lines. So if we keep them monthly clean, we shouldn't hit a big problem. The only issue, that's, I shouldn't put it out there, but God forbid a total collapse happens and it stops it. There's no going through it. We'll have to go into an emergency measure. But what they see, they do not foresee that happening. Mm -hmm. It's the state that it's in, it's, it's going to be in that state. It's just going to constantly cause us pain. Unless we have an earthquake in it. So yes, that's and that's what we'll be doing over um, the winter to keep that, keep us going with any trouble there. Um, we're still waiting on the, the rest of the train coils to be replaced. It's unbelievable the amount of time it's taking. I've been I talked with them Tuesday. They're still waiting. Uh, to give you an idea of that. We got they got four in, which we originally wanted. Mm -hmm. One was good, the other three were wrong. So we sent those back, we're waiting on the, the other ones. And so with, that left us with one classroom without air conditioning. And we have since put a temporary air conditioner in there and the teacher is, is okay with it for now. Um, so each week I'm calling them back to check on where these are. Um, the last thing I think you mentioned, oh, oh with the stage. Um, Again, we decided we're going to do that in January and February based on the scheduling of the school, what everybody has planned up to through Christmas, and what the stage company has available as far as work. Right now, they're working on auditoriums they have shut down because they're in such disrepair. We're not, we're not near that. We're just old and need updated, and so they're comfortable with putting us to January and February. Um, the last thing is the doors that were approved at the elementary school. Uh, we were moving ahead with that, and we just put it on a temporary hold because we came across fire code. Um, we had to call fire code officials in. We talked to both uh, townships. They referred us out to the people, the code inspectors that they talked to. The issue is school safety codes have not kept up the fire codes have not kept up with safety codes. It's easy for the public to say, we have to lock down our pots in a shooter situation. So if we shut and lock those pot doors, we're in violation of the fire code. Those are an egress and the, fight, the exit signs point this way is get out the fire. Pat and I looked at it and Peg and I looked at it at her school. So it's just not as easy to go in and pop in a set of doors and say, we're good, we can lock them now. Now we're violating the fire code. So it's, it's a temporary setback. They're looking at how to get around it and what, what we need to do. Um, so we're in compliance with all the, the codes that need to be in compliance with. And that's on those interior? Interior pod mm -hmm. doors. Um, the gym and uh, cafeteria doors are OK the way that they egress, mm -hmm. those will be, because right now you can't, there was a need to shut and lock them down, most of them, you can't do it. So the new doors we get, they'll be metal, they'll have all new hardware, they'll be able to shut and lock, you know, in case they lock down. Um, that doesn't affect egress. It's just the interior pod doors and how we have to change our signage. Um, and right now, people aren't willing to just sign off on it. They, there's about the red tape to go through we have to do it and before we put the order in for the doors we don't want to do that and have them come and say no you guys can't hang this we want to deal with this first but that should be temporary because we're talking top side code issues right now so hopefully by the next time you talk i'll send you updates so that we got the okay to go in the fashion we can let's do it put the order in. and they said they'll definitely work around school um, so right now the doors are in order. So until we get answers from <coughs> both the code people, everything's on hold. Right. Except for the cafeteria, you ordered those. Except the cafeteria yeah. doors. We're moving ahead with those. With the pod doors, yes. If we are open. able to use those doors, we'd have to rewrite that grant then, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, we would have to figure another set of doors or another option that you wanted to go with. But yes, we need to do revision. And right now, that has not been approved yet. 
none, nobody, we just got an email yesterday um, saying that, you know, with all the influx from the state, everybody had to have them in on the 31st. It's going to take them time to go through it. So okay. if we need to do a budget revision, that's no problem. Anything else from the board? Where did we leave the film discussion for the film on the board? Well, that would be, we discussed that in executive. Anything from the public? Hearing none, I will seek a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Book a regular, Mr. Swank. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Uh, roll call. Mrs. Haddix. Here. Mr. Macri. Here. All members present. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the August 11th. 2022 co curricular committee meeting. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number four, uh, we'll be looking to move items one and two forward to next week's voting session. Any questions from the board or the public on items one and two? Okay. Seeing none, I'll make a motion to move those items forward to next week's voting session. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any items for discussion? Just a point of information. Mr. Ambosi sent a list out today. Next On next week's agenda, he's going to ask to have his game managers listed. That's why it's not here today. I just got it. Today. Great. And uh, tomorrow evening is our salute to service game, uh, Crestwood home game against Wyoming area. Uh, so there'll be a lot of uh, festivities and honoring. What's that? Yeah. So uh, National Guard will be there and, and uh, we'll be honoring uh, a local uh, World War II or Korean veteran? Korean veteran. Two. World War II veteran. So kickoff's at 7 um, and uh, should be a great night. And uh, any other discussions or questions? Seeing none, we'll ask for an adjournment. Adjourned. Aye. Aye. Financial planning, Mr. Brogna. Thank you, Mr. Boone. Uh, roll call. Mr. Swain? Here. Mrs. Haddix? Here. Uh, I'll be seeking a, a motion to approve the minutes from the August 11th Financial Planning <laughs> Committee meeting. Do you have a motion? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, under uh, sub uh, item four, uh, we have three uh, sub points, one, two, and three. These are items that we seek to move to the board meeting for a vote next week. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee on these items? Jim, is that number two? Is that the walk-in cooler? Yes. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Any questions from the, the rest of the board? I think we have um, a, a short presentation about the jumpstart card. Oh, okay. Just, like, just discussing what's coming for our students. Do we have that now? So, Jackie, you like it here. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, so, one of the items on the agenda today that you'll see um, is no, under number one recommended uh, consideration of people of the of the jumpstart card. So, I know that some people in the Mountain Top area are already with the Jumpstart card as it is a food truck that has been uh, around the uh, mountaintop area recently. Um, but what we're going to do and what our proposal is is a pilot for something much more than that to bring to the Crescent community. And so I'm um, really excited to partner it with getting your approval with Jackie um, and her company and she can tell you a little bit about what we've talked about so far. So the Jumpstart card was established in 2019 truck-based business um, in order to employ special needs adults after leaving school age. Um, I operated for the first time this summer about one to two days a week, um, locally most of the time at the Broadway to Topic 309. 
um, and met a lot of people in the community and had some really great feedback. Um, I learned a lot of, I had some really great things happen and some barriers that occurred. Um, and talking with Beth Ann, we thought we can bring it um, to the Crestwood School District and really help build um, the transition program here, um, as well as get uh, a unified club involved so that it can be a whole school program. So one of the things I know when I started here in um, 2020, one of the goals and the missions, I had worked with Special Olympics and for Unified Sports, one of their um, sentiments is that um, similar to Mrs. Malazzo, like teamwork makes the dream work. And so when you have people working side by side, students working side by side together towards a shared goal, it organically grows a positive climate. So looking at the climate here, we've seen the benefits already from our unified track and field team. We were the first district in Luzerne County to have a unified sports team. We have worked together with them and three years in, we're now going into our third, third year. We have 14 schools in Luzerne County who have jumped on board with that. So we're actually able to compete competitively together in schools in Luzerne County. Through that, we've developed a unified club inside the school and it's comprised of students with and without disabilities. Um, severe developmental disabilities make up 50% of the population and regular ed student leaders make up the other 50% to work together on the field. And then in school, they work to spread the idea of inclusion. Um, so in thinking of how we could expand that and seeing the great things that Jackie's doing with the Gemstar cart and knowing that our students lost about two years of transition services that they could have had with those experiences when we talk about career, and to Mrs. Haddix's point, you were speaking our language as you were talking, giving the students experiences to know. That's where you really learn. Is this something I like? Is this something I want to do? For us as educators, being able to see them in action in a community, um, a community customer service way or a prep way, preparing you know, to-go boxes or rolling silverware, we can really get an idea of their skills in a much better way and then also work as a team to help them transition their transition goal it's, it's a very real life experience that they're going to get. I bring the food truck here. The food truck has been developed um, to have adaptations and compensatory strategies already built into it, and I continue to build that as I grow it. Um, it's a panini-based food truck, so originally when I started the idea, I wanted it to be as safe as it can for all levels of employees that work with me, so we make panini sandwiches. Um, there's never any fryers or stoves. Um, plan to be on the food truck. Um, other things that I've done so far as well as made visuals um, of making the sandwiches. Um, we had a grant that got us an Apple system so that we can adapt the Apple system with pictures. So maybe you can't read that that's the sandwich that was ordered, but you know that that's the picture of the sandwich that was ordered so we can build those skill levels. Um, having a, a background as an occupational therapist when I'm not doing the food truck um, helps me kind of build and grow and see the strengths and weaknesses in some of our students and be able to adapt that and continue to help them succeed. And the Gemstar part is part of a wider initiative, a broader initiative um, in, in general here to continue to target the climate towards inclusivity. I, um, there's a Comet store that should be coming shortly um, that's also going to be the Unified Club, so all students with and without disabilities working together. We have our emotional support classroom and those students um, also working as mentors for our students with severe disabilities to um, operate the school store, potentially a coffee shop for um, the staff here, and then in conjunction with the Jumpstart car, an opportunity for all of our kids to work side by side in a team environment and um, you know give them valuable skills and then allow us to see them in different life. For a lot of students here that have other skills besides the reading and math and they don't get you know highlighted as often. So giving them other opportunities here on campus um, to really shine and, and be leaders in their own way is the goal. Mrs. Harris, would you uh, say that it's an extension of the classroom? This is an extension of the classroom, not focusedly fo on the food, but it's about the extension of a classroom. Um, do you, would you agree with that statement that it's an extension of a classroom? Absolutely. I think Jackie can talk a little bit about the skills on her truck specifically that they are going to bring in. I think 
Friday, tomorrow. Is this tomorrow? Well, I guess tomorrow. Um, <laughs> tomorrow, potentially, um, she would come in and, and start to work with the students on those pre-employment skills that they, they would be necessary to eventually get this up and running. So there's a lot of learning and practicing and teaching that goes on um, prior to the, to the actual delivery of the, of the panini. Yes, the there's there's definitely many levels and steps that need to go on. I think the best part is it's an extension of the classroom, but not no longer the simulation within the classroom. And that's what I liked about talking with Bethany and bringing it to Crestwood is we're going to go outside and in the truck and kind of just navigate around and feel comfortable in it. And we're not sitting at tables and, and you know, practicing skills. Like we're in the truck doing those things and, and making real food and serving it to people and, and hopefully the community and however we can progress that. Um, so one of the things I think I really liked in talking with Jackie um, also was that she had found in the development of her food truck that that population of a actually accessing that population of student who's graduated now over the age of 21, it's hard to access them where they are. They're not in programs, they're not in school anymore. So her goal as a business to employ that child, she needs sort of a pipeline to have those students eventually be competitively employed, which is her goal. So for, for us, it was like a natural symbiosis because I have those kids prior to 21, and if she can get their feet wet and get them, it's just going to serve the community better because eventually they would have the potential to be competitively employed with her business. And the overall thought of the Jumpstart card too is to be self-sustaining. So some of my barriers with were having difficulty accessing um, someone over 21. And what happened was they were putting me in the bubble of culinary. But, and if somebody doesn't check the box of wanting to be in culinary, they don't even have access to try out the food truck to see. But in order to stay self-sustaining and use less grant money so that I can progress um, and hire more employees, there's more things that happen on a truck than just cooking food. There's prepping it, setting it up, cleaning it up, maintenance of the food truck, washing the outside, so many other different things in order to sustain. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to, to get involved in that way, to be able to get as much experience as possible. Just one highlight, um, the founders of the food truck, Jackie Elick and Jessica Light, are both pressed with grads. Just shows that we have good people doing good things. I'm really excited to do like a pilot and take a pre-employment part of the Jumpstart cart and come back to where I started and kind of see what things do. So thank you. Are you doing this at any other school district? No, this is the first one, so that's what makes it a little bit more exciting for me. Is coming to school here and having Crestwood be uh, the first school that I talk to have talked to with it. I've had some other interest in other uh, districts, um, but I, I've, I've talked to them the end and I, I think that like it, in order to come here, I like, not that Crest is super small, but for me, it, it has that community feel because <coughs> I have grown up here and I've worked in the area. Um, so I think we can have some great success for our community. Is the truck self-sustaining or do you need school power or hookup or anything? It's self-sustaining. Thank you. I didn't realize you were having such a great presentation. One, <laughs> one of the best of the whole committee reports. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm familiar with the truck, so I, I, th I assumed everybody else did, but I think it's a great, it's a great model. I mean, it certainly doesn't really even belong under financial other than what's being approved here. It's certainly a model for a program that can be replicated in other districts and other for other disability employment um, and especially students pre-employment lost two years of transition uh, it's amazing for children with special needs um, and I, just to speak to that sure. too, I was speaking with Beth Ann and, and that was another barrier that in operating this year um, I worked with some programs and I had a job coach for one of my potential employees and not realizing how much support I really needed for that employee while we were operating the truck and so I said what a great experience to give our our students to build some of those skills and and then at 18 21 whenever they're ready to to have that success just to walk on the truck and be able to work that's great um any other any questions about the the jumpstart trip cart or <clears throat> any of the public questions about any of the other three items that 
on the agenda. Um, seeking a motion to move these items to the uh, board meeting next week. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we'll move this uh, to the discussion items, which is district financial update and upcoming budget process. The favorite one, right? That's what everybody's been waiting for. It's coming. Oh, it's just. I don't. Seriously, I don't. Okay, because I have vetoes. Okay. You just can't lose it anyway. He didn't have credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so good evening. Um, today I'll be going not specifically over a budget presentation, but it's just kind of a final um, a district financial update and then some possible upcoming budget processing conversations. So some of the items that I have planned to discuss with all of you today is um, just a quick update of 21-22, and then we're gonna go over um, our current school year, 22-23, and then looking forward to 23-24 and the budgeting process plan. So 21-22, so we just finished our 21-22 school year on June 30th, and the update that I have for you right now is that we have started the auditing process. If you remember, we approved Axelrod. They have a Z last name, it keeps going. I usually pronounce it incorrectly, so we'll just say Axelrod. Um, we had our preliminary site visit. Um, it went very, very well, and they were here on August 22nd. We had them scheduled to return for a complete audit. We're hoping for the end of September, early October, um, and then our AFR deadline is October 31st. We could ask for an extension, but my kind of personality, we like to try to get it on time and not ask for extensions, so our goal is not to do that. Um, and then we should have an auditor and report for the board in November. So that's our timeline to close out the 21 So here we are now, 22-23. So we just started our 22-23 school year on July 1st. Um, the school year ends June 30th. And uh, we, if you can remember back, the board did approve our tax and uh, revenue anticipation note. That was needed, okay? And that was uh, used in the summer to complete payroll, to complete comp time payouts, our start of our school needs, and our ut utility expenses. This is something that gets done every year unfortunately at the district so I just wanted to share that with all of you it definitely was needed the full TRAN amount was 4.5 million however we only have pulled 3.1 million okay so we did get approved to get 4.5 the reason we didn't go to any higher than the 3.1 was once you pull that money out then you can collect interest on it so you're trying to strategically take what we need and leave what we don't need so Last year, um, we paid our TRAN off in November, and we're looking to hopefully pay back the, the TRAN as soon as possible, looking in October and November. And um, the good news is our state subsidies are coming in on time. Um, you know, if you remember, the budget, you know, was a little delayed on passing. So um, good news, state subsidies are coming in. Tax collectors are handing in payments, so thank you to our community for paying your taxes. Um, so, as soon as that starts coming in, we can pay off that train. Yes? You, I, I can't recall. What was the, the, the interest rate on the train this year? Do you recall? I don't recall. Um, I don't have that. I know you sent it. I couldn't recall. Yeah. Uh, do, would you remember if it was a higher rate than the prior year? It was a higher rate. So, our borrowing costs more money for the taxpayers and the district. It budget. was, yes. Okay. It yes. starts with the two. I read, I don't, I don't want to say off. It's definitely higher than last year because last year the bank screwed up and gave us a 
ridiculously low rate. Yeah, I can get that for it. I know no, I have I an email somewhere. I think it's important to note that when we have to do this, yes. this uh, transitional borrowing, it costs yeah. more money. Yeah. So it's. Sure. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't remember. That's fine. So looking ahead, 23-24, um, I put the five-step process. This is just a, an idea of a plan for the step process. So step one, um, you know, as you guys know, last month we have a, a transition of business office. We have our interim business manager, Joanne. We have Mr. Tommy Benz officially starting in October. Um, we continue to use Tony Reba, our consulting. So as a team, was kind of waiting for them to get their feet wet, get started, and then as soon as we're ready, we're going to announce some budget committee dates. Uh, so that'll be step one. Step two, we're, with after those committee dates are announced, we're going to start sharing information about a preliminary budget. Okay, Doing that it allows for opportunity, more discussion, um, so it gives the board more flexibility with decision making, potentially if we need to make those decisions towards the end of the budgeting process. Step three, continue those budget committee meetings. Continue to be transparent. Continue to be upfront with the community, with the board, and share where we are. And um, you know, just having those discussions and reminders, and just keeping everyone informed. Step four, propose final budget. If you remember, that was around May. So that's around step four. Step five is final budget adoption, which is by June 30th. Um, and I put a little note there at the bottom, PD did not release dates for 23-24 budget timeline. So traditionally, preliminary budgets are approved in January, um, but I just don't want to go out there and say this is the, the deadline date because the state didn't even get those out yet. So, um, but just rough preliminary, you're looking step two to be around January, step four around May, and step five in June. Okay, so 2324, again, the preliminary budget. Just, I think it's important that we wait to have any kind of budget conversations to know officially where we ended, right? I stood in front of you and I shared what I thought my crystal ball, like where we were. Maybe I'm spot on, but I could be, I could be, you know, I could be in the worst or I could be right on or I could be above. So I just would rather wait to have our official audit done so we know where we can go moving forward. So, after the AFR is completed in November, uh, but there are two components in a school district budget. So if you remember, we talked about revenues, we talked about expenditures, and with those two separate components, that's what builds this budgeting process, and those are the two top areas that we're gonna be focusing on. So in the budgeting process plan, Revenues. So what are revenues? Again, those are your state subsidies. That's your property taxes. I put a bullet point there for Luzerne County ARPA funds. That deadline, it's a grant where our, uh, it's called GCS 20 Rebum, works with our administration team and said, okay, what are the key areas that we would like to get support from? What, where could we get help from our county? And the application deadline is September 15th. Tony feels he can meet that deadline. And some of the areas um, that he put into the grant, again, with his support of administration, is technology, capital improvement. So we've been talking about the paving project. The, the important part with it, the county grant, is we have to match it. So we're trying to actually go retro, active, for things that we've already purchased. And then that way we can use those funds to build future projects. So we sat together collaboratively, came up with a list, and I'm hoping even if we just get some of them, we could start moving forward with our other capital needs. And then safety grants. Um, we did do the PCCD grants. Mrs. Campbell sent us some other ones. We did look into them. Unfortunately, those ones we won't be able to use, but there is another safety grant that comes out in October. So we're looking to do any kind of grants that we can do, not just for school safety and security, but anything. Um, so we. We are really tasking ourselves to not just always look at expenditures, but looking about growing our revenue. Okay. So expenditures, I mean, we're potentially, everything's very preliminary, but some options um, that we're going to be discussed, and we actually have been working together um, to look at different expenditure reductions. Um, again, these are all potential. 
but we're looking at, of course, reducing our operating expense. We did a great job last year working together with all of you and looking at different operating expenses. So we'll continue to look at our operating expenses. We're looking to reduce comp time. You know, we did put proactive measures in the full-time day-to-day uh, -day subs that we have. That should help reduce the comp time. Um, our administrators are really focusing on that and um, we, we're making sure that we're using every body that we have and appropriately putting them in places. Um, you know, something that we've talked about last budgeting and talking potentially for this budgeting is potential furloughs. Not a, a key topic that we want to share, but you know, to be transparent, that may be an option that will be going to be given to the board if we cannot find um, reductions in other areas or increases in revenues. Discussions on potential salary freezes along across the boards with administrators. It could be with professional staff, support staff. Just again, this is all preliminary, but these are items that we're gonna be looking at. Um, voluntary retirements and res resignations. We did have that last year. Potentially we may have that again this year. Um, we are doing some <coughs> preliminary work on early retirement incentives, seeing if that's something that the district wants to, maybe it's not gonna benefit 23, 24, but maybe that'll be benefit 24 and 25. So we are looking into those avenues. Healthcare savings. And when I say savings, it also could mean the increase of healthcare, right? Traditionally, healthcare continues to grow. So we also need to look at the measure of, you know, maybe we could stabilize our healthcare costs instead of rising 10, 20%. So looking at healthcare savings and cyber attendance recovery. Um, I am very, very proud of the administrators here in this room, and there were some are remote or not able to come today. They did a great job um, this year and are going to continue to do a great job. We were able to collectively between the team here, they have between a high of 130 to 160 uh, Crestwood Cyber. This year we're at 52. So amazing work to them. Kudos to you guys uh, putting in the effort and the time to getting our students back into our classroom. So um, we're just going to continue to look at that. Um, if we see a big spike coming in, we're going to say, okay, what's going on? But keeping a focus on cyber attendance recovery fund. Mm -hmm. So if I had to guess, where do I think 2324 is going to be? Again, preliminary, we are going to be in a deficit and potentially between 2.4 and 2.6. Um, again, like I mentioned, we are proactively starting now. Okay, we're not waiting until January, we're not waiting until March, we're starting now, starting with our collaborative, uh, we'll call it new biz off business office team, and we are proactively looking at operational and staff expenditure reductions, and we're going to continue to investigate new revenue opportunities. That doesn't mean that it's all coming from the taxpayers, right, we're going to try everything that we can proactively to um, find grants or just, you know, proactive measures that we can for revenue. That's what I have. So any questions? Is it normal for the school district to start in the negative every year? Normal? Yeah. From my experience, <laughs> yes, it has. And through, through conversations with your business office manager, your business office team, through collaboration with the board, it always starts here and it goes down through having those conversations early. So projections are always way higher than Absolutely. where they end up being. Correct. Yep. The Luzerne County ERP funds. Yes. Uh, there were three different um, phone conferences because the Luzerne County hired a firm to manage that. Did someone participate in one of those preliminary conferences? Because they walked through the I mean, I assume the work that you may be telling me, mm -hmm. they walked through every detail, what do you qualify for, what doesn't qualify. And it certainly should refine down the pot. Um, and then, of course, there's three different portals with which entities could qualify. Yes. Um, I'm sure Tony or someone participated in that because that's really the crux of most of it's an online form that's just 150 characters per grouping. And you have to answer all the questions. I do know several council members that had talked about because they have the ultimate say. Even though there's this entity that's going to be approving, the council members have the ultimate say in 
and several had said that they wanted to see some investment. Was there a, a mandatory match? On any they are recommending a match. Recommending, correct. Right. Doesn't okay. mean that if we don't match it, doesn't mean that we won't get right. it. They're just rec they like to approve projects where it's showing a match. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I think have to. Oh, oh, I guess that's it. Any other? Anything else for the financial committee? Any questions? If not, we have a motion to adjourn financial committee. Second. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, thank you to everyone who attended and participated. And thanks for your patience. And the last two months, I think we've had a lot of lively discussion and a lot of it uh, student-centered, which I think is a good thing for a change. So thank you again. We are adjourned.